Hey, how's it going? Great. Great. Yay. Woo. So I'm excited for so many reasons about CypherCon. Uh, a stage is nice. A microphone is nice. You all are great. This is this is fantastic. Another thing that has never happened to me before um, is is being invited to give two talks back to back. So hopefully you guys will survive this and not be bored. Um, this is really this is really exciting to me because. Uh, I've oftentimes talked about these talks as being two sides of the same coin. The first one being street cred, which we're going to talk about uh, how to protect credentials and how to protect the front end of authentication and where that's going. And the second part is mistaken identity, which is, okay, now that you've protected those creds, what type of mistakes are your developers probably making that undermines everything that I talk about in hour one? So, that's it. Double header. I actually do a workshop on this, which is, which is pretty funny. But, uh, all right, so... Go with me back in time just a little bit. Go with me back in time to uh, to like the dawn of hacking, right? Before there's the cool music, before there's the cool murals, before there's conferences, the dawn of hacking, when the term hacker first was defined. You guys remember? Anyone want to shout out where it was? Anyone know? 93. 93? MIT. Oh, MIT, yes. I thought you said 93, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> it was 93. I remember the dial-up sounds very well. Yes, MIT, MIT. So, this was the computer, the IBM 7094, a glorious piece of machinery. It was, it was truly BYOD in that the university brought it, and that's all you got. Um, it was very famous for two reasons. One, I'll tell you about halfway through this talk, but the first reason this was famous was because this was the very first computer, the IBM 7094, in the MIT, the late 50s, early 60s, where the term hacker was defined, the first computer to have a password. That's exciting, right? Yeah, yeah, we're gonna share a secret with the machine. People loved it, just like our user loved passwords, which is why, footnote, this is the machine that had the very first password breach at MIT <laughs> in the 60s, when somehow, miraculously, Surprisingly, we don't really know how lost time someone put all the passwords on the message of the day file and printed them out. No one likes passwords. But it started, it started this really interesting cat and mouse, right? What do we do? We do demand more of the, the human? Do we have them like remember a password? And it's, you know, for this university system and hopefully they remember it, and they share it, or rather they don't share it. Or do we ask more for the machine? Do we ask more for computational, maybe protect it, maybe don't store it in the clear, maybe don't accidentally or intentionally mess it up with the message of the day file. We've had this back and forth for 60 years, <laughs> six decades, six decades we've been fighting this. We get better algorithms, the criminals break the algorithms. We ask for better lengths and passwords, people write it down. This is like giving up. I had a, a uh, call and they're like, Wolf, tell me what the latest advice from NIST is. How long should we make our passwords? I'm like, this, this is given up. Eight characters. That's it. If you ask any more and, and people are going to repel. They're like, but wait, in eight characters, if we use Landman, we can get that right away. Yes, yeah, you can. And even if we don't use Landman, if it's like NTLMv2, we can like crack it in like a day. Yes, yes, you can. So why eight characters? Because we've given up. <laughs> I'm sorry. Tell your people 16 characters, and when you're updating your resume, come find me because my employer is, is hiring. Um, oh, I should mention that. By the way, hi, I'm Wolfgang. I started talking without even introducing myself. I am an advisory CISO. I work uh, with Cisco Secure. Uh, came out of dual security, so I've spent a lot of time thinking about multi-factor and thinking about identity access management and all those sort of things. And so I want to talk today about where we are in this journey as we've battled for six decades to somehow secure a password to figure out the right balance between demanding more of the user and demanding more of the machine. Um, and I'm gonna talk about how that maybe translated to password less, which I'm very excited about. I'll touch on risk-based auth, which I think is absolutely needed. Um, and, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about how great it is to get a SAML assertion or, um, you know, OIDC jot and we'll all go, yeah, that sounds great. And then you guys can come back at six o'clock and say, and then we steal those jots. <laughs> and everything is terrible. All right, multi-factor. 
Multifactor, right? Multifactor is good. We we had the password, and uh, and passwords are cool, right? I mean, I, I I don't know. I've got like a nostalgia about passwords. 1993 is what I thought someone said, which is right about the time I created my first password. Right? You log in, you're excited. Your parents say you can create an account. I'm like, yes, I will name that account. And they're like, yeah, but not that name. That's what are you, 10? I'm like, yeah, probably. All right, no, different name, but you can create a password. You create this password, this really awesome password that's a shared secret between you and the machine. No one else knows it but you and the machine. It defines your identity. It is amazing. And then you have to create like 20 more and 30 more, and then it sucks, and then they told you you have to rotate it, which this is also given up on. Congratulations, guys. Eight characters, don't rotate it. It's fine. It's cool. No one's going to mess with that. <sighs> so. This has been a problem for a long time. We know as human beings, human beings are storytellers. We are poets, we are artists, we are stupid, and we create passwords everyone can guess. They were cracking the BSD passwords, like the original, like the smartest people that I know, right? Like Ken Thompson and Eric Schmidt and these geniuses of our world. They're cracking their passwords recently. This is from the 80s. Um, I like this one, this is uh, Ken Thompson's. It's a chess move. I think that's clever. Of course, no one knew he liked chess. Uh, I'm sure no one guessed that. The other one is my favorite is Eric's. It's his, it's his wife's name, it's Wendy. That's cute. It's got three exclamation marks, which is secure, right? Special characters. He was ahead of the time. So we've been doing this for a long time. We, we pick passwords that are very easy to guess. And a lot of people are like, oh yeah, and sticky notes. Sticky notes comes up a lot of times when I'm talking about this. People are like, oh yeah at sticky notes. I'm like, when was the last time you saw a sticky note? Um, but it happens. I'm like, yeah, in 1993, when we had one or two passwords. No one has a wall of 500 password sticky notes. So we write them down and we misplace them and everything. So the solution, of course, is multi-factor. Yes, yes. We will take this terrible thing, which might be pretty good if you have an exclamation mark, and we'll add some strong factor to it. Awesome, great. But then, and this by the way was, was predicted. Like anyway, if you talk to anyone like five years ago, six years ago, um, if you ran to Alyssa Miller, she'd be like, deep fakes are gonna be terrible. And you'd be like, yes, you're right. And if you talk to someone about passwords, they're like, yeah, once, once there was a multi-factor, they're gonna hack it. You're like, no, I figured the bad guys would quit. <laughs> they're like, no, they're gonna attack. And that's what we're seeing, right? Sim swap attacks. Especially cool if you've got millions of dollars of cryptocurrency or NFT. Just let me know what your phone number is. It's fine. Um, you walk in, and there's actually like lawsuits about this, which I think is great. You walk into the store, you say, "Hi, you know, I'm the person who I'm stealing this from. My phone got broke." And they're like, "Oh man, that sucks. I'm so sorry." I'm like, "Yeah, it really does. Can you give me a SIM card?" And they're like, "Yeah, bro, I'll hook you up." And then you steal their crypto word. Awesome. Awesome. Or any other sort of swim swap attack. SS7s are pretty cool. I was um, Circuit City Con. Anyone go to Circuit City Con? Any animals? Yeah, fun time, fun time. I took my wife there when we were first dating and we're out to get coffee in the hotel lobby and she's like, why is my phone weird? And I pull up my phone and I go, oh yeah, it's, that's Shanghai time. That's, that's probably not normal. And I look at the phone and it's like, oh yeah, LTE. I said, turn your phone off. She goes, why? She just trust me. Apparently we're in China now. I don't know. We're with hackers. That's what hackers do. We change the the you know tower and everything's fine. And uh, and surprisingly, she still married me. I don't know. You know I would have thought that would have been a clue. But yeah, so you you compromise this tower, which isn't hard to do, and then you do an SS7 attack and and you get the token. Awesome. Um, submit your crypto. Easy to break. Duplicate code generation. Well, that's bad. I still have people, and I don't know why this happens. I still have people go, and this, I swear to you, two weeks ago before this, um, and if uh, you see this on the recording, I'm sorry I'm talking about you, but I am talking about you. They're like, hey, I got this great idea. I'm gonna roll my own MFA. <laughs> why? Because it'll be cheaper and easier. Yes, it, it will, until you're compromised. But it, okay, anyways, so duplicate code, especially prevalent in people who are rolling their own. Uh, golden Samuel tax, which I will not talk about in this because that's a spoiler for earlier or later. Uh, push fishing, or now called brute force push, I think, which is especially fun. I'm going to set up push, and, uh, and this is what one of the attacks that was described to me was something like this. Person 
privileged user, should have known better. Um, had their email account compromised, the password compromised, and it kept getting pushing push attacks. You know, that's not me, not me, not me. And they just kept sending them and sending them and sending them and sending them and sending them. The person goes, well, that's probably me. Click OK, adversary's in, ran a bunch of scripts, uh, backdoored his email address, used his email address to send a bunch of other emails to other people, including one with ransomware, and then someone clicks it, and then spreading throughout the local subnet. I think the entire thing was like 15 minutes after he clicked, yes. Meanwhile, your SOC SLAs, what? Eight hours, 16 hours, 200 days, Verizon says. Anyways, maybe your SOC isn't gonna catch that. So that's happening. Uh, Evil Engine X is happening where you think you're logging into account, but you're really logging into something else. All sorts of different ways to, to go on to things. So you're like, okay, that's cool. You depressed me, Wolf. And I'm saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but it gets worse. Because you may be thinking, okay, that's all, that's all fine and good. We'll just have everyone use biometrics. Yeah. Did you guys catch the Talos blog where they 3D printed people's fingerprints and logged into all the phones? <laughs> that was cool. <laughs> uh, so, things are happening. Things are happening. And one of the questions I get asked all the time is, are these things possible? Yeah, they're, they're possible. I mean, if, if you're in CypherCon or Circle City, someone's going to mess with the tower. If, if you got a whole bunch of money and they know your phone number, they're going to SIM swap attack you. Um, if you got biometrics, they might try and 3D print them. Yeah, yeah, but is it likely? No, no. Thankfully for most of us, I don't worry about it. I don't know about you guys. I still have, and I, I hate to say this in this audience, but I still have SMS, MFA for some things. Why not? It's easy. And for low risk accounts, sure, sure. So is it is it going to happen hmm, soon, but probably not now. But this all gets us into thinking about passwordless, right? So if you think about that entire line of everything going wrong, the still the most terrible part of it is that shared secret that we're all coming up with. That's probably our pet name or our wife's name with exclamation marks. So the whole trick about passwordless is to remove that shared secret, to get rid of that shared secret, and to move on to one of those other factors, hopefully multiple factors. Why now? Why now? Um, in early 2000s, Bill Gates stood on the RSA stage and he said, we will kill the password in two years. <laughs> and it sounded really cool. And in 2020 at RSA, the last RSA I was at, I stood in a, not on the main stage, uh, in a side room with some reporters and I said, with WebAuthn coming out, which I'll talk about in just a minute, with WebAuthn out, we will kill the password in two years. Yeah. Gates was wrong, I was wrong. You're probably like, why are you comparing yourself to Gates? Not my first time, when I dropped out of school, I told my mom, but mom, Bill Gates did it and built this entire company. And she's like, but son, you're at community college and your company is systems integrator. I'm like, oh. So, a bit of a, maybe a little bit of hype, but we've been talking about killing passwords for a very long time and haven't gotten anywhere. One of the reasons we haven't gotten anywhere is because we didn't necessarily have good sensors, right? It's very expensive, and we'll come back to this as one of the, the big sticking points. It's very expensive to do biometric sensors everywhere, but thankfully we'll have phones now, which most of them have it, so we have that. Um, it's very difficult to create protocols that allow you to log into things. Um, with WebAuthn and FIDO2 and the CTAP protocols, which I'll cover in this talk. Um, cool, groovy, now we've got that ability. So the, the standards are out there, everything's coming together, and we're able to like bring this together and, and make something happen of it. It's still taking a while. I would have thought we would have been further by now. But some of the things that I found kind of make sense is, yes, smartphones are ubiquitous, except for 13% of the population does not have a smartphone. Yes, smartphones are ubiquitous in the workforce, except for that's only the white collar workforce. What happens about your hourly employees, your seasonal employees? What happens about your gig workers? We start parsing that out. There's so many different people today who don't have technology, which I would argue is probably a much bigger conversation than why can't they log in as passwordless? If we're honest with ourselves, why are we not paying people better and equipping them better? But simply from an authentication perspective, lots of problems. Okay, Wolf, I can buy that, but you said we've got protocols now, like FIDO2. I'm like, yes. We've also had SAML for a while. How many apps right now are single sign-on? 
And the problem is that SaaS apps are still surprisingly few in terms of federation and adoption of that protocol. So this is taking some time to, to get to that point. But, but we're on a good point. Also, what's kind of cool is that dichotomy of man versus machine. Do we make people remember more things or do we make the machine work harder, computationally more intensive? That actually goes away because with passwordless, it's actually easier, which is very uncommon. I did a research project uh, I want to say five years ago now, and I asked people, hey, tell me how security improved your life or made you faster. And once they stopped laughing at me, oftentimes they just stared at me uncomfortably and said, you're from the office of the CISO, aren't you? Like, I am, I'm sorry. Isn't there any way that things got faster? Like when you go away, right? It's very rare, we're like, no, we really made your life better. But with passwordless, we can do that. Single sign-in is another thing, there's other ways to do it. So that's cool. All right. So for this, this talk, I want to cover like a path to get to passwordless. MFA, we'll talk about, we'll talk about authentication workflows, looking at ways to do the trust, right? So if everything breaks, like I talked about earlier with different factors, how can you still have trust in that authentication and then enabling uh, the passwordless experience and moving to a toolkit? All right. First, do MFA. We all should do MFA. Everyone should do MFA. So the whole idea, of course, is passwordless is we just remove the password and we do MFA. Knowing, of course, that there's a lot of factors that are still weak and vulnerable. Okay, so fine. We'll do passwordless, but we will remove all the weak and vulnerable, except for in use cases, again, with hourly and gig workers and customers. We're going to email them and provide QR codes. And I'm not talking about any of that. I'm talking about strong passwordless, which is one of these factors in play. So rather than logging in with our, our username and password, we get rid of that password and we're like, ha we're good. Except there's still some additional things we want to do. We actually want to make sure that we are checking things. We want to make sure that we've got two-factor because auditors are auditors and auditors take time. And if we go, hey, Mr. Auditor, guess what? You know that standard you said about 2FA? Like, yeah, you did PCI. Yeah, you know that standard? Yeah, that was great when you did it. Uh-huh. We got rid of that. They won't like that. <laughs> they will push back and they'll argue and they'll mock us down and then we'll have an audit finding and we'll have to explain to the board or the executive team why we're no longer compliant. But we are, we'll say, because it's a stronger factor and no password. Yes, but you need two, including one that's terrible. Was the old joke about multi-factor? It's something that you've forgotten and something you've lost. We need those two. <laughs> we need those two. So with passwordless to reflect multi-factor and reflect sort of the fault tolerance of these different factors, we want to go ahead and move towards um, still having two steps, but doing it all in one step, if that makes sense. The standard behind all this is FIDO2. Love me some FIDO2. These are the same guys who brought you FIDO1, surprisingly enough. Um, it's the YubiKey standards that we're all used to, right? It's one tap to get in. It's an awesome thing. They collaborated with, uh, with Duo and with Microsoft and with Google and Apple, and they built it in the browsers and built it into devices, and so now we can go ahead and log in. So if we're sitting there and I've authenticated to my device and, uh, and I'm using a strong authentication to do that, I can pass that on to the application. One of the things that's cool about that is the key material that it's exchanged with the application is on a per application basis. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because they probably have 200 applications, um, 10 of them have probably been breached. I mean, if you wanna have some fun, go look at your customers who are logging into your applications today, pull that customer list and run it against have I been pwned and see how many of those accounts have been caught up in compromise. I'm betting the number is 60 to 80%. That is a made-up statistic right here on stage. <laughs> Check your own data. So that doesn't work if I've got multiple different, um, you know, signals or multiple different factors for each one of these applications. So if I compromise this application, I can't go ahead and replay. It. Very cool. Also, also, rather nice. I'm going to use the URL as a check mechanism, so I don't even pass that material in if someone's used a weird character or is phishing me or doing those sort of things. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Now, problem with that is it's platform-based with an internal authenticator. What that means is if I'm doing that with my phone and now I go to my desktop, my desktop is a different device, doesn't have that authenticator for my phone. 
that sucks. So now I, what, I log in with my desktop? Maybe I just never use a desktop again? Maybe I retire, I like that last option. Mm -hmm. So they've got a different way to do this, which is, okay, we're gonna move towards um, using a factor outside of the device. So my desktop and my other desktop and my phone can both use this other factor, and that's going to use the CTAP protocol or UTF to go ahead and check. This is also pretty cool. Our right, first case um, is I, it's my device and my credential on my device. Awesome. All right. Real world. How many people have like shared devices? Right. They go to the hospital recently, or call a call center or and, and, and. Shared device is pretty common for those of us not in IT, so therefore having a, a external authenticator pretty groovy solves for that problem. Um, we can also move that out to having a roaming external th uh, third party, such as doing a push or doing something else or doing biometric, so that no matter what device I'm using, I can do something external. Now all this is happening through the front channel, which means that all the first three patterns are all happening through the front channel, which means potentially it could get intercepted, it could get messed with, um, which means potentially that we've got uh, threat vectors. So another option, which is my preferred one, which is the user logs into the application, and the application behind the scenes, rather than through my computer, um, does some sort of check with a authenticator to go ahead and log in. So, four different ways of deploying this, all within the protocol. Also within that protocol, of course, is threat models and different ways that they've figured people will break this. All right, so what this looks like in practice is I've got my username and password and I'm logging into the cloud and I'm logging into something on-prem and I'm logging into my device and, and away I go. And I wanna go ahead and put MFA in there first so that I can enroll them and have, make sure that we get those other factors, either UTF or push or something, and then get rid of the password. Easy. First problem. Uh, we need to make sure that they can't downshift factors. This is another problem that happens in multi-factor. Oh, you can't log in? No problem. I'll send you an email. Um, oh, your, your super strong authenticator UTF token that you've enrolled is no longer with you? No problem. I'll send you an SMS code. So at that point in time, what is the effective stopping power? of that control if you can downshift it. Pretty low, right? It's gonna be the strongest, the, the least strongest factor uh, in the downshift or, or in the recovery. Oh, I lost everything, so I'm just gonna go ahead and re-enroll. Awesome. How do you prove your you? Um, <laughs> what are the interesting ways, side note, one of the interesting things I was playing with, have you guys seen the selfie uh, authentication? This is kinda cool. You hold up your, your ID to your phone, and then you turn your phone around and take a selfie, and then like, aha, you are you. Turn your head a little bit so it's not deep fake. Okay, you're in. I love that, that's exciting, identity proofing. Great solution. Um, how many people are using that? <laughs> not many. It's usually back to links and QR codes and driving me nuts. So, downshifting, first problem. Second problem is making sure that we're, of course, avoiding all those factors in the downshift. All right, so we get people on some different factors that can log in, we get some place to, to beef that up. Let's talk about consolidated workflows. Part of this problem is, goes back to what I said earlier, one of the reasons why this technology is taking a little bit longer than I thought, besides the point that for some reason we've been doing other things the past couple years, what the hell is that? I think we should be focusing on authentication, none of this, that's work from home, let's save lives. Okay, that's important too, but, Think about the password us, people. Um, part of it is, is a lot of these applications take a real long time. SaaS applications take a real long time to support protocols. Another part, of course, is that we've got a lot of passwords and a lot of applications. Love looking at my password manager and seeing the 400 passwords that I've got in there. Um, again, stat I made up on stage. I'd encourage you to look at your own people and their own passwords. They probably have 191. That is not a stat made up on stage. That's a recent, uh, recent stat from 2019, I think it was. A lot of passwords, a lot of applications to, to handle. So rather than doing this on a one-off, what we wanna do is think about ways to like put in place SSO so that I can go ahead and do passwordless into my SSO portal. My SSO portal can talk to SAML, everything else. And you say, but Wolf, you just told me a lot of applications don't support SAML. And I go, I know, passwords are gonna take so long to kill. 
but that gets us a ways down the path. Now, how many applications? Typical enterprise is running 1,400 applications. That seems like a lot. How many of those are gonna support SAML? Probably half. How many of those are gonna be worth putting in SAML? Probably half of that. So we're talking about 200 applications, I would uh, estimate to move into passerless, which means 1,200 probably that are good attack surface. And that's of course if you're attacking the UI. If you're a pen tester, you're like, <laughs> yeah, 1,400 applications. Let's do the math. That probably translates into 15,000 API endpoints. This stat I just saw in dark reading, which blew my mind, typical enterprise, 2022, 15,000 API endpoints. Love that from a red team perspective. How many of those are protected with MFA or passwords? I'm going with five. I like the number five. Um, and that's assuming, of course, modern tech stack. Legacy oftentimes comes up. RACF, we don't have a good solution for mainframes. Uh, legacy, legacy Windows applications where we're still having to be on-prem. Legacy managers who want workers to come into the office. Um, I suggest replacing the latter, upgrading the former. Um, but we also have to figure out what we're going to do about this legacy. And that's going to be like application proxies and auth proxies and everything. Bottom line here is legacy protocols will get us. This will be in that, a vector that adversaries will go through. Microsoft got hit with this early days of 0365. Why? Because they were supporting all the legacy protocols. Of course, why wouldn't you? My users still use SMTP. They loved it in 1993. They love it today. It is a great protocol. So Microsoft was supporting all these protocols, and they were allowing you to log in through all these different endpoints, and you would, there was a great attack where you'd log in through an unprotected endpoint, and you get a SAML assertion, and you'd pass that SAML assertion into SharePoint, and SharePoint would go like, yeah, that looks groovy. Come on in. Like, okay, even if SharePoint had MFA enabled, even if all, everything was perfect, you could pass that token around. Not cool, not cool. We're gonna still have that from a legacy protocol perspective. There's gonna be a million and one different opportunities from an API perspective. The API uh, landscape is still horribly uh, unsecured um, to get jots and get assertions and pass them around. And it's again, assuming we even know about these applications. When I put that stat on Twitter, that uh, 15,000 APIs, according to the survey, they're like, oh, I, I must be missing 10,000 APIs. Someone replied back. And I'm thinking, yes, <laughs> you probably are. And I'm not saying that to be mean. Um, when, when I look at some of the cases from Duo, they'll deploy like MFA and they'll get a device inventory and they'll think, we've got 20,000 devices. And they'll deploy and they'll go, we've got 60,000 devices. <laughs> When I first moved to cloud, I thought I had 200 apps. And then I deployed a CASB, <laughs> it was not 200. So we need to be aware of these things and get ahead of these things. All right, now we need to talk about increasing the trust in applications. So in this step, of course, we've got to use it in Prague, going to MFA. Uh, we need to look at ways that we can look at device trust, which is probably one of the, the predominant ways today to reduce attack service. If it is Wolf coming from Wolf's house on Wolf's device, Wolf Wolf's username, and Wolf Wolf's fingerprint, it's probably me. And if it's not, I'm gonna 1099 that bastard. I need, I need some help. <laughs> Please, I'll give you my, no, I'm just kidding. Please do not break in my house. That's not really an invitation. All right. Um, and then the, the next thing is once you're in passive device trust, looking for some validation. So let's, let's look at that first side of things. This is again putting more of an onus on the machine. This is rules and policy and correlation. Uh, we, can, we can talk about like device identity, right? If it really is Wolf's device. Well, how do I know it's Wolf's device? Well, maybe it's because I got something in the TPM or in the secure enclave that says this is Wolf's device. Maybe it's because I've got certificates, which can be just a, oh, incredibly frustrating to manage certificates on the device. Fleet, right? I think anyone who's doing that knows this. The device suddenly aren't responding or aren't in the right vault or don't come available or have expired. Oh, a bunch of problems there. But maybe we do that with cert base, which I like, at least because we're doing a strong based authentication. Or maybe we do it with an agent or MDM. So different ways that we can do device identity. But the trick is with WebAuthn and CTAP to tie a user to a device or in the case of shared devices, to tie a user to a uh, roaming authenticator that can be used 
to prove to the device that really is me. Groovy. Now, um, you guys remember the early days of ransomware? Did anyone really think it was like important or did we all just sort of like laugh about it? Am I the only one who's laughing about it? Is, who, who thought like ransomware in like 2005 was like, remember, and to, to bring us all back, Ransomware 2005 was like your uncle called you and goes, I don't know what happened, but my computer looks weird and they tell me I need to send a coin bit, right? 2005 ransomware. Do you want to take that? It's like, oh, it's the old people. I love them. I will help them out. Right? That's what we thought. And then the ransomware guys went, hey, we've got money. We should go after the, the companies with the big money. And ransom went from like a dollar to like seven million. And suddenly it's annoying. But it started off in this consumer space. What I think is really interesting is, another thing that's right now in the consumer space is remote, um, remote fraud, right? Hi, I'm, I'm Bill Gates, and I need to fix your computer. And my uncle's like, oh, Bill Gates, sure, help me out. My, my Windows is really slow. And then they like get you on and they, you know, they get the passwords and everything. That type of attack right now is, is very much, I feel like, ransomware in 2005. It's a consumer thing, we're not taking it seriously. When we've really reduced the attack service to, if I want to compromise you, I need to compromise your computer and other things. We're gonna see a very big increase in those types of attacks, I believe. So therefore, we need to look at more than just, is this the computer? We need to look at the, the OS version, the browser version, we need to look at what is the state of that device? Uh, we need to make sure it's not jailbroken or infected, those sort of things. Right away, we're gonna do another problem, don't we? Because if we've got a device workforce, if we've got union rules, if we've got um, any number of different things, depending on the culture, they're gonna be like, yeah, no, you're not putting anything on my box. Or, no, that's my personal device. If you want to do that, provide me a corporate device. And the CFO is going, no, no, we're not, we're not buying computers and phones for everybody. You're like, but he won't do it. They're like, we'll figure out another way. So we are, <laughs> we're going to run into some issues with this. And there's some different ways to do it, like a MDM light and looking at user agent strings and different different ways to think about it. All right, that is like that is the hard and fast rules, right? This is the yes no answers. That is the, the yes, you're infected, or no, you're not infected. Let's talk next about some of the more exciting stuff. Uh, first, I want to go back to this guy, it's IBM 7094. I told you there's two interesting things about it, right? One was very first password and password breach. Second thing was HAL, right? The HAL 9000, Arthur C. Clarke, the end of Space Odyssey with all the weird music at the very end. Well, not at the very end. The, at the very middle of the very end. Uh, Hal starts singing as he's being unplugged. He's singing Daisy, if you guys remember this. And this is weird, right? Why would he be singing Daisy? That is ridiculous. And I have wondered for every single minute of every single day since I found the answer of why that was. And here's the answer. The IBM 7094 was the first computer to sing. They taught it to sing Daisy. Arthur C. Clarke was touring an IBM plant and they made it sing Daisy and went, that is fantastic. And they took IBM and added a couple letters to Hal and had it sing. We've been thinking about smart computers for a long time, but we thought that we'd be all passwords by now. And we thought by 2001, we'd have Hal. Uh, or at least, at least if you're like a, a Jetsons fan, like if you love the, the Gucci style of the 60s, you thought maybe I'd have at least a Rosie, right? I'd have this sassy robot maid that would cook for me and push around the vacuum. So I priced it out. <laughs> it was like $600,000. I was like trying to figure out what it would take to have like a Rosie. Um, and I'm like, yeah, and then, then we could have like a robot that would push around a vacuum. And my wife's like, or we could buy a vacuum that just pushes around itself. Okay, that's like $600, maybe 200 if you get it on sale, fine. So, a lot of what happens with AI and ML is it gets hyped up because we think it's gonna be hell, we think it's gonna be rosy, we think it's gonna be amazing, we think it's gonna solve all the problems, and it won't, and it doesn't, and that's stupid. What is smart is to use it where it makes sense, where it's something like a rosy, or where it makes sense where it's doing something very, very well known, like, again, back to Alyssa's talk with deep fakes, or finding slide images, where you're like, hey, show me cake, and it's like, here's all the things that are cake, and you're like, most of those are cake, some of those are sushi, but that's okay, that's good enough. One's a cupcake. I don't know. I'll think about it. It might be in the book. So when we use AI that way, it, it makes a lot of sense. When we use AI to kind of sort of figure out 
when an attacker is being successful or not, I think that makes sense. Um, when we apply to security, we oftentimes run into these problems where there's high variability in normal use in attacks. I'm gonna look at AI across everything and use UEBA and tell me when people are abnormal. And the little poor little bot looks and goes, everything's abnormal. And then we freak out and we block everything and then for some reason people get mad. It's much better using these models, I believe, to look for very, very specific things. I'm very pro AI ML when it's things like, tell me when a computer is doing something weird. Tell me when something is abnormal. Um, tell me when, you know, uh, impossible travel, or the browser's changed, or it's not even a browser. I thought it was Jane at home, and it's a computer from Russia with a headless browser logging into the bank account. That should probably be stopped. And we can see that very easily with a Roomba. So if you think about the pyramid of pain, it's really trying to use those hard and fast rules to weed out what we know is bad early on early on and using the ML really after that, after we've removed a lot of the noise to highlight any sort of patterns that may be popping up. Because looking at this and trying to figure it out is just not going to work, especially if you're getting like 10,000 alerts a day, which a lot of socks are, as we know, it's much better to run it through, get some contextual awareness and highlight what those problems are. So good data models after the rules is really important in terms of increasing that trust. Roomba's not Rosie's. Purpose-built AI. So we've increased the trust by looking at the device. Authentication. Recognizing that any of someone can steal a cert and serve may go bad or anything. Uh, we've increased the trust by looking at the state. Recognizing that yeah, someone may bypass that or be a good attacker, have some custom malware or all that sort of stuff. Um, and then we've got some residual risk that will reduce by running that through some data science against a good model, against a limited set of data, with some known bad signatures to go ahead and pop up things and then block that connection. All that, that sort of increased trust side, I think is incredibly important part of this conversation. Why? Again, because we can't trust any factors, certainly not passwords. All right, once we're in there, we're gonna move everything to passwordless, why not? Pick our individual use cases, get rid of the passwords, and use the controls I mentioned earlier to increase that trust. Better devices uh, for smarter enclaves, behavior analytics, running our policies, all those sort of things. Because now we're saying, I'm not just trusting a single factor to authenticate you. I'm trusting a multitude of different signals to make sure you really are you. And, and I recognize and I've built my system such that if you're not you, if there is fraud, and there will be, and it will happen, then it's a manageable amount of fraud that we can act on and respond to in a reasonable way. And then we just cycle that again and again and again in a sprint fashion. Now, one concern about this is, okay, that's cool. Um, so I'm gonna do that for my desktops, and I'm gonna do that for my phones, I'm gonna do that for my call center, can do that for these web apps over there. I'm building something over here, I'll do that for over there. I've got customer use cases. I got some B2B use cases. And next thing you know, you got like a dozen different applications and a bunch of different ways for things to be misconfigured and broke and go wrong. So another part of that, of course, is making sure that as we're stacking this on from a defense in depth perspective, we're still thinking about economy of mechanism, which is not having a million and one tools. I love this stat. This is from uh, 2019, which was that uh, the more vendors were used, the longer people were down. It went up to uh, 17 hours with 50 tools. I want to be the team with 50 tools. Don't want to be the team down for 17 hours. And first of all, I thought, this is so weird. But then I remembered I had this outage um, when I was with financial services. And I brought all my team together. I'm like, fix this. And I'm like, yes, boss. I wish that's how it happened. What it really went is, what the hell is going on? They're like, we don't know. I'm like, go figure it out. And so they all ran to their own consoles and uh, gave them like, I don't know, an hour. Hour later, everyone comes back and the networking guy, I'm like, what is it? He's like, it's a networking problem. I'm like, I knew it. Probably DNS. Ask the server guy. I'm like, what is the problem? He goes, it's our virtualization stack. The CPU and the memory is everything. I'm like, I knew it. Should have never virtualized. 
Everything should have kept on an IBM 7094. We won't be having these problems right now. And, and every single person, I swear to you, blamed their stack. It was the network. It was the storage. It was the compute. The security guy was sure it was the Russians. It was, no one could give me a good answer. And so we actually had to get, go back through and figure it out. And, and I, I believe this because when you got to that many tools, every single tool is giving you a different answer and it's just a complete mess to do IR in this space. So taking all this and continuing to federate it out and moving into more of a passive state and integrating the technology so we can get better results. Um, security Outcomes Study is a study done by Scientia in, in partnership with Cisco. And uh, one of the things that they found was that 41% uh, of companies with highly integrated systems uh, reported, I'm sorry, let me say that again. Organizations with highly integrated systems reported 41% more likely to have threat detection. If something happened, they were more than twice as likely than their peer group to be able to find out what happened and resolve it and everything. So we gotta integrate that technology. All right, I'm gonna conclude. I'll open it for questions. They will, I don't know, stop the recording or start the recording, I don't know how that part works. And then I'll start the next part of this talk. But in conclusion, all right, one of the things that I think is very risky about passerless has to do with functional fixedness, has to do with the fact that as a species, we're very bad at recognizing something new. If we're talking about passwordless authentication, we're already defining it as, I'm gonna get rid of the password. Okay, that's cool, that's cool. I'm from Detroit, drove to Chicago yesterday, drove to Milwaukee today, and uh, in Detroit, 100 years ago, what was high tech? It was the horseless carriage. It was a carriage without a horse, guys. This is great. We're gonna get rid of the, the, the big horse. It'll be awesome. But that entire framing belied all the increases in comfort and safety and the changes in our society that let me go in one day to Milwaukee to CypherCon, right? The horse's carriage is so antiquated now, but yet that's how we think about passless authentication. And of course, we've learned our, our lesson in, in the automotive. We don't ever do the same mistake again. I'm not gonna to touch driverless cars. This is just a problem we have, right? We always define an innovation by what it's not. So first thing is, as we move to passwordless, as we finally, as a security function, have something that can provide a user benefit, we have to think about what do we ask? What do they owe us? What can we use this moment in time for to increase, to change, to refactor, because we know the bad guys don't stop. As a matter of fact, every single time over the past six decades that we've thought we've fixed this, right? I was talking about hashes earlier. Every time we've come up with a better hashing algorithm, um, the criminals have defeated it, right? We move, the criminals move. We make another, the criminals make another. Um, and too many controls get put in with the idea that this, this is the one. I will do CASB and no one will ever copy and paste again. Okay, we're just not gonna use your CASB checkmate. I mean, you know, <laughs> everyone thinks, we'll put this control in and this will be the end. But we should know by now, and we should recognize that every time we do, the criminal takes a step forward. Everything we do improves the, the strength of the criminal. So what do we need to do next? Um, in terms of street cred, in terms of credentials, we have some patches and some fixes and some things to do immediately to shore up passwords and multi-factor. We've got to do that. We've got to get more folks on the multi-factor, more folks uh, recognizing that passwords aren't doing it. We've got to put in place better controls when the multi-factor starts getting attacked more. All that needs to happen. Meantime, things like passwordless, FIDO2 and whatnot, great for doing pilot programs, great for exploring, especially if you're building an application. If anyone in here is in SAS, Please support SAML and please support FIDO2 so that we can use this and we can get off of it. We need to tie our authentication changes to broader initiatives. I like passwordless as like a user business case for zero trust or a user business aspect of digital modernization, those sort of things. And along that same lines, we need to take steps to increase trust and authentication because we know the adversaries are just gonna try and find ways to work around it. 
All right. Questions? Yes, sir. How have you had conversations with end users, individuals who lack We all want to do password lists for the whole I heard the first part of that. How do I have what conversations have I had with users that don't want to go to password list because of fourth and fifth amendments? Because of fourth and fifth amendments. That is another really good example of what happens. So um, this happens a lot in international travel. I travel internationally. I won't use biometrics on my phone because it's been the passwords are protected, but I can make the, as a police officer, I can make you look at the phone and now I'm into your devices. So that is a very good thing. So one of the things we can talk about there is maybe you still have a pin or maybe you still have something to, to provide it or conversely, maybe you take additional steps like disabling passwordless when you're traveling or in those situations. Um, similarly, we're starting to see a tiering of security by location. My home office is safe-ish. My corporate office is safe-ish. Everywhere else is not. So that's sort of like thinking through the motions in different places can influence that. But you're spot on. If, if, uh, if I'm being asked, hey, do everything with biometric, but yet I know that someone can force me to do things, I'm going to be very leery with biometric. Touch key is another thing, like uh, YubiKeys and things like that, would probably be what I would be pointing people to as well. Yes, sir? Um, privacy. Uh, the slow. Oh. So yeah. did you ask that? Sorry. Uh, the, slide, the slide talking about kind of the future of passwordless, uh, it, it looked like a data set that could be mined. What, what are some things that can, uh, can mitigate that challenge? So Schneier once said that security is both actual security and perception of security. So I'm going to address actual security, and then I'm going to tell you why none of it matters because of perception. Um, one of the things I like about FIDO2 and I like about these standards is that that biometric data and that privacy style data is stored on your device, especially if it's your phone or your personal device. It doesn't leave your device, it's not centralized. The only thing that leaves your device is a derived key. So I use the biometric to unlock my phone and my phone then has a, a uh, key pairing with the application. Um, so I don't necessarily have privacy concerns. Now you may say, well, wait a minute, but the application will know who you are. And I'll say, yes, it will, but you've logged into the application. So you decided at that point in time to give up some anonymity. Now, all that is true, but the perception is Big Brother is stealing all your passwords and all your faces and all your fingerprints, and I now have them. The reality is, is that a lot of organizations are still running in corporate culture where like, I don't trust you to use biometric. I don't trust you at all. And, you know, frankly, I think security people and IT people have shot ourselves in the foot over the past couple decades, and there are reasons that perhaps they shouldn't trust us. So there is a technological answer, which we can do immediately, and there is a cultural answer, which is going to be a much longer haul. Any other questions? Sweet. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Please applause.